Okay, I think we're uh, ready to begin. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the uh, Vignelli Center for Design Studies and Design Conversations Lecture Series. Um, I'm Roger Remington and I am uh, prof Vignelli Professor upstairs. Uh, we'd like to uh, make sure that you're all welcome and we're very happy to have you here today on this beautiful uh, afternoon. Uh, we're very fortunate today that uh, we have a speaker who is really going to the very core of what we're about at the Vanilli Center, and that is talking about the Vanillis and talking about design and their great work. Um, our speaker today is a professor at uh, Rowan College in um, uh, Pennsylvania. Glassboro, New Jersey. Glassboro, New Jersey, I'm sorry. And um, as a friend from from the past, uh, was formerly a professor at Fredonia State, and in that capacity, we uh, did a lot of work together, and it's great to uh, welcome you back to RIT. So would uh, the rest of you please join me in welcoming Jan Conrad. Thanks, Roger. It's great to be back in Western New York. It's like, there are a lot of people who are, think that oh, you move to South Jersey, the weather's better, you're gonna love it down there. I'd be back up here in a heartbeat. It's way better up here. So um, what I wanted to do today is to, first of all, say thanks to Roger and thanks to all the crew at RIT. It kind of feels like my home away from home and it's nice to be here. It's nice to be contributing to the Design Conversations lecture series. And I'm certainly honored to be able to talk about Massimo and Layla. Um, they've been a big part of my life. They've had just a little bit of influence around RIT as well. Um, and I think with a half century of their work over the entire spectrum of design, we can talk for hours. And I'm sure Roger could fill in all the stories that I don't know, but we'll start with a little bit smaller scope than that. I think you're so lucky to have their archives here because between that and the additional wealth of material that's over in the Carey collection, over in the library, dig into it. That's my best advice because there's so much to explore and it'll make a difference. Um, so to start, my biography about Massimo and Layla was published this summer by RIT Press. And writing it was a challenge because, as you might know, there are approximately three million video clips and quotes and books and movies by or about the Vignellis. And so part of my question and challenge was they've been criticized, publicized, analyzed, lauded. What can I say? What can I add to the conversation? So what became meaningful for me was not to focus so much on the work, but to focus more on the connections and on presenting Massimo and Layla as people, two very interesting and smart and capable people. And so what I want to do today is to really focus on how they as people kind of connect backward and forward and where are we at the moment? So it's gonna be a mix of all three of those. The first thing and the first challenge that I faced when I started really writing, besides figuring out what to say, was then the second thing was I pretty quickly said, this book is about both of them. And one of the things that I wanted to do when I wrote this biography was to make it as much as possible, as much about Layla as about Massimo. She deserves and she earned equal billing. Um, some of you know that that was not an easy task either because about the time I seriously started doing this research was when she was diagnosed with dementia, early stages of dementia with Alzheimer's. And more quickly than any of us wanted to admit, she got to a point where she was not really able to speak for herself and now is, is not capable of that at all, which is sad, but that's the reality of the disease. So 
not be, thankfully I had some firsthand information from her and could corroborate information from other people, but the combination of the limits of, of what I could get directly from and about Layla, combined with the fact that virtually everything that came out of Massimo's mouth was an eminently quotable, made it an interesting challenge to try to balance so that they were both showing up equally in the book. And that leads to talking a little bit about Layla. Layla was a gifted designer also, and perhaps doubly gifted, because she was not only being a designer, but she was the manager. And she was managing personnel, budgets, clients. She was managing fabrication, the construction realities, the billing, and visual form. And that freed Massimo to be singularly focused on being creative, creating, being the designer. It makes me question something. We ascribe the word genius to someone who has this singular ability in doing one thing very well, but it makes me wonder why we are so nonchalant about someone else who is able to do multiple things with equal effectiveness. And Maybe we should rethink our definition of genius. Some of you are students, quite a few of you are female, and it's important to also know what Layla thought about that. There are a lot of women in the design profession now, but you need to realize as women that you're still gonna have to fight you're gonna to have to fight for equal recognition and equal respect for equal ability and equal work. In this day and age, females are still on average 23% on the dollar to what the guys are making. And Lelu had to fight. She had to fight for that recognition. And even Massimo recognized that because one of the last goals in his life was to create a book that documented Layla's work and Layla's thinking. I think that as she became less able to be the partner that he had always relied upon, he gained a new appreciation for her in the last couple or so years of his life. Caring for her gave him firsthand knowledge of the complexity of managing a lot of the tasks that she had done seemingly effortlessly things that he'd always been able to take for granted. And in his introduction to Layla's book, Massimo wrote, female architects have often been relegated by assumptions, by the media, by ignorance or arrogance, to supporting roles, even when they shared the position of equal partners. He said, Layla's work and her life has been a fantastic blend of logic and playfulness, spirit and pragmatism, and down-to-earth logic and idealistic vision. So Massimo, in developing a book for Layla, was publicly acknowledging her work and her vital role in their success. And in some ways, I think perhaps it was his penance for maybe not sharing the spotlight with her as equally as he might have over the years. So for the women in design, and for the men who live and work with us, I'd like to ask you to be mindful that we all play vital roles, no matter who is holding the pencil or the mouse, and that the creative process is a complicated one, and we need to fully support each other in that process. Layla faced catcalls and outright belligerence when she would go to a job site. She faced assumptions that when the clients were dismissive, they were assuming that Massimo was the real boss. But she faced this with class, and she did not back down on what she knew was right, and she did not give up, and eventually she earned respect because she was consistent and she was smart about what she did and what really mattered, which was successfully creating and implementing quality work in the field of design. 
So let's talk a little bit about the foundation that kept her and Massimo centered. They both were absolutely committed to the principles of modernist design. The Vignellis provide entrance to understanding and validating modernism as a right, in a rightfully broader sense, not simply as visual form. They connect us to the intellectual, the social and the cultural aspects of modernism, to the idealism and the optimism for design's potential to improve society. And these are too often overlooked in a simple critique of visual form. I'm sure that most of you know that modernism is not universally acclaimed, despite its intentions toward universality, because some people latch onto the word modernism and they immediately prescribe a definition that is absolutely too narrow. It's a definition that describes only the visual form and only in a severely limited way. So it turns modernism into nothing more than style, and that is not what the modernists intended, and certainly not what the Vignellis wanted, and it negates the substance of thought and purpose that has continued value and meaning even today. Sometimes I think that people who are disparaging of modernism use, it, use that disparagement as an easy out. Rather than intellectually validating their own work, they try to give it meaning by being anti something else. That's lazy and it's superficial. When people criticize the Vignelli's work for lacking individuality, I think they're wrong and I think they're missing important points. So I want to talk about that, talking about the key modernist who highly influenced both of them and was a hero to them, so Mies van der Rohe. Architect Mies van der Rohe, architect, furniture designer, there are a lot of similarities when you compare Mies and the Vignellis. Mies focused on embracing technology and the potential that it opened with materials and processes. He focused on quality as an intent, not a negotiable possibility. He focused on perfection as an honorable goal. And that last, in particular, ties him to a long line and a long tradition back to another beloved influence of the Vignellis, the Italian Renaissance masters. So in the mid 20th century, and still today, some people question a need for permanence when we're in a fast-changing world. But me stood fast, as did the Vignellis, in valuing an attitude of permanence, and he respected and promoted durability as a seminal aspect to architecture and design, a tradition not to be forgotten, not to be set aside. The Vignellis upheld the same perspective through their entire working career. Our fast-paced, fragmented, data-rich, but often context-poor lives seem more ephemeral than ever. But rather than contribute to that sense of speeding up and tossing out, the Vignellis actively fought against it. For them, an attention to detail and a deep understanding of form, materials, and meaning connected directly with an intention to create lasting durability. They focused on timelessness and on a creation of universal solutions, not because they feared change or lacked, universe, or lacked creativity or individuality, but because they believed in Mies's statement when he said, we must make clear, step by step, what things are possible, necessary, and significant. So timelessness was a core value. Let's see if this, did it come up? Yeah. Okay, good. So looking at just a few images for the moment and thinking about that idea of modernism, thinking about the idea of timelessness, thinking about the idea of the intellectual approach to design, 
I wanted to take a break here and show a few images, starting with um, a quote from Layla, talking about how they worked together. Massimo often also said, you know, I might be the one holding the pencil, but this is a team approach. And Layla's criticism and sharp eye and sharp intelligence were equally apart, no matter who held that pencil. The idea of respect is something that was absolutely a timeless thing and an incredibly important thing for the Vignellis. Respect yourself, respect your clients, respect your society, and show that respect by creating the best work that you can do. It's interesting, last night I was listening to Milton Glaser do a presentation, and he was talking about his students, and he said, I ask them to make a choice. He said, you can do exquisite work for low pay, or mediocre work and have lots of money. Which one do you want? And he's like, the students never want to make that choice. And he's like, no, you can't blend. You have to pick one or the other. And he said, over the years, it's been interesting because there are some students who pick exquisite work. And there are some who say, mediocrity is OK, because I'll do that for the money. And he said, guess which ones are still working in design? Vignellis were the same way. Don't support mediocrity. And they had a long tradition of modernists. And you here, with your connections to RIT, tie into that tradition of modernism, going back a century. So Peter Behrens said, design is not about decorating. Walter Gropius worked for Peter Behrens and then became the director at the Bauhaus, saying, we are going for standards of excellence, not novelties, not transients, not ephemeral. Mies van der Rohe took over at the Bauhaus, and of course, God is in the details. I always tell my students, the, uh, God's in the details once you figure them out. The devil's in the details until that point. Others, the Castiglione brothers, you need constant, consistent way of designing. It's not about style. And Corbusier, here's Gropius again, Ernesto Rogers. Massimo is often credited for saying that a designer should be able to do anything from a spoon to a city. Massimo wasn't the first one who said that. He heard it from Ernesto Rogers, who may or may not have heard it from an Austrian architect. We're still checking that one out. And then from all of those come the Vignellis, long live modernism. This is something to celebrate, not set aside. And from there, of course, we have Roger and many other good people here, and this building, and the archives, and the exhibits, and the speakers. Thinking and working is an enduring part of the legacy that we should be proud to support. It's not a style, it's an attitude. So the next time somebody goes, oh, the modernists, all they want to do is minimal, boring stuff. It's like, it's not a style, it's an attitude. If it's boring, that's your problem. Practicality. We develop good work by being disciplined in that work. And that discipline comes from thinking, using materials, how they function, and putting that together in an effective way. The Vignelli said, planned obsolescence is a crime because it is wasteful of resources and it is damaging to our home and our experience on this earth. Supporters of modernism speak of honesty of materials, clarity of message, and less is more. It's practical, it's logical, but detractors look at exactly the same thing and say boring, simple, repetitive, lacking excitement, impersonal, 
out of touch with current times and attitudes. But really, I ask you, who is out of touch? The Vignellis felt a deep responsibility to convey meaning. They focused on the purpose of design rather than design for design's sake. They allowed clients to make wise choices, investing for lasting use rather than spending for constantly changing superficial style. But that doesn't mean that's all they did. They also very much embraced joyful living and an appreciation for all the world has to offer because these are the things that are the real riches in life. Their niece, Leila's niece, um, Katerina, talked about the difference between Leila and Massimo and other members of her family from the earlier generations. And she said, one of the things that was always nice about Leila and Massimo is that they took time for the things that are nice in life, for a nice dinner, for going to an opera, for traveling to a beautiful place. These are the riches in life. And the Vignellis worked with pleasure and often with humor, definitely with keen observation and with satisfaction. And those attributes became a part of their design as well. And so their work was very personal, but first it was very purposeful. They did not do frivolous work because they didn't see that as contributing to a serious world. And so right now what I want to do is to show you just a few pieces of the work that they've developed, maybe organized in a way that's different than you've thought about it before. But it's how they would be thinking about it. So design solves problems. How do you take the signage system for an entire country, train the Italian railway, and think about the fact that you have densely populated urban areas and very small out of the way back areas you have international visitors who may or may not speak the language. You're trying to get them from the trains to the to street transportation, to the airport, to whatever, and make it clear. Everyone knows that the Vignellis did, and Massimo particularly, was involved with the signage system for the New York subway. But that wasn't the only one. The entire train station in Italy and as well the subway in Washington, D.C. Not too long ago, well, there's a couple things going on down there. They're expanding the system, so they're adding new stations and, and new platforms. Um, and as a part of the expansion, it's sort of ironic. In this bottom image, you see these pillars and all the information in the initial setup as the, as the Vignellis designed it was on these pillars because the architect did not want signage on the walls. If you go to DC now, the pillars are certainly still there, but there are also areas where that repetitive wall signage is there, not because the Vignellis made a mistake. The Vignellis worked within the restrictions they had to, but the reality over time became, you know, it really would be good to have more than those individual pillars. So the system still substantively builds off of what the Vignellis did. So here we have an example that goes back half a century and still functions. Isn't that purposeful, meaningful, in-touch design? The Unigrid for National Park. Um, you may have noticed that there are some aspects of our population who complain about government spending. So how does something like the National Park Service develop a system that allows them to use money effectively um, to get a lot of messages out about a lot of different parks all around the country? And so this system was developed, a purposeful system that allowed a, a proportionally 
changing sizes and modules, I guess is actually the word I should use, to use modules that could be of varying sizes to create any and all of the varying needs for any and all of the national parks, I think that's pretty meaningful design. Purposeful design, whether it's birds, mushrooms, trees, dogs and cats, we do like to know more about these things. And so to create um, the Audubon Field Guides and to set up a structure that allows us to, on an individual basis, have that in our backpack and go out and grow and learn and explore and feel confident in that, is purposeful. Design is observant. Have you ever been in most, more, most New York City apartments? They are about the size of my closet. So, okay, table and chairs are kind of an important thing in most people's homes. But tables and chairs take up a lot of space, but maybe not so much if you think about can we push the chairs underneath and create something that's nice and clean and neat and minimal and space reductive. You have some good friends over. Do you really want one sitting there, one sitting here, one out there? No, the whole point of having friends over is to gather together and to have a conversation and to be able to intimately engage with each other. So here we have furniture that wraps around you and really sort of frames you into that situation. It encourages the development of these close relationships. I suspect some of you cook. How many times have you read a recipe that says, oh, put it in the oven and you should probably pull it out and check it and then maybe even turn the pan and rotate it at some point? Um, how many of you have burnt your hands because the lips or the lids or the edge to grab is small or not there at all? I hate those stupid white corningware things that have these little tiny things that by the time you have a hot pad big enough to hold on to it, you, there's nothing to hold on to. So Layla is the cook, was the cook, and Layla said, why don't we have something that becomes a lip that goes all the way around. So no matter how it's in the oven, you still have something you can get a hold of. And why not make it beautiful so that it can be the serving dish because, geez, do you really want to bake it in one thing and then move it to something else and then move that to the table? So can't we rethink these things? And came up with a line of dinnerware that did exactly that and the lids also can be smaller serving dishes if you wish. These things are great, I love these. A story that I'm sure many of you have heard. So you have a dinner party and you're all sitting around and you're having that last glass of wine and then the table's a mess. You know, the chicken bones and Lord knows what else and it's all sort of mushy and icky because you've all been enjoying that dinner. So the whole idea is how can you create something that you can efficiently stack and carry out and cover up with a lid and make, as Massimo liked to say, a clean pile of dirty dishes. <laughs> design is appropriate. Good design is appropriate. I bet every one of us has some weird little plaque or one of those black frames with some really bad fake German calligraphy that says, you know, you won the spelling bee in fifth grade or the wrestling match in junior high or you got to band camp and were the best clarinetist and they're all just ugly and I bet we all have, I mean, seeing everybody smiling because we've all got them stuck away somewhere because they have meaning, sort of. Layla said, why couldn't you create a line of jewelry based off of numerals 
and that maybe that can become something that can become a, a memorial, a celebration, a recognition of some significant moment in your life and not end up being an ugly plaque that you shove in the bottom drawer until your spouse says, can't we clean out finally, huh? Appropriate, St. Peter's Church in New York City. The Vignellis developed the whole interior of this project. And St. Peter's Church is a really interesting project because St. Peter's Church is also known as the Jazz Church because they do as much music concerts and different kinds of events there. It's a social community place as well as a religious place. So appropriateness becomes really important. And part of what the Vignellis did was to develop a modular system that was able to easily be moved around and reconfigured so that if you want a jazz concert, it's one way. If you want Sunday service, it's another. And that idea of the functionality for a multi-purpose space that felt perfect for whatever that purpose was, I think is really important. Layla designed the fabrics, the cushions for all of the seats the seats on the side, the backs of them can fold down to protect and hide those cushions and become risers if you want to have a chorus in there. So lots and lots of possibilities. It can be a place where on the left you see an orchestral concert and on the right was an image from Massimo's memorial ceremony held in the church that he and Layla designed with such care. Design has integrity. Massimo developed this map. It's a poster, a map, flag. Let's go for flag. He developed this, um, was asked to develop it as part of a campaign for America's bicentennial. And so what he did was went around the city, got all the newspapers and all the different languages that he could find and ripping and reorganizing, created this American flag. And so when he submitted it to the powers that be that were managing this, this poster thing, somebody said, well, we really like the idea, but can you do it again with better news? You know? He's like, no, I can't do it with better news. The news is the news. You don't just change something because it's not conveniently saying what you want it to say. That, that totally destroys the meaning. So he refused to do it, and they refused to print it. And it was not part of that bicentennial series, but the integrity to him was more important. And ultimately, he did print it, and it was done in a limited edition um, silkscreen run. Integrity. Materials are important. How can you create something beautiful without adding decoration? So this Sasaki dinnerware was created by creating the simple geometrically based forms and then that outside cantilevered, not cantilevered, but angled edge, um, the glaze was wiped off of that. So the natural inherent materials themselves showed through as the quote decoration. I debated telling this story, but I have to because I cannot ever look at this tea the teapot or sugar bowl anymore without thinking of it. So Lev Zeitland was one of the interior industrial designers who worked very closely with Layla on the process of creating this dinnerware. And as they were coming up with prototypes, they had drawings and they knew they wanted the sugar bowl to be this beautiful little round bowl with this little, call it a nipple lid on it. And so then when it came time to actually sort of make a plaster cast, and they were trying to figure out how to show it. Lev said, he looked at me, kind of grinned, and I, like, I said, what? He said, I went to the drugstore and I bought all the different condom brands. And I found out that if I filled this one condom with wet plaster, that I got this perfect shape. So 
it really sort of takes away from the beauty of seeing these final forms, but I, I can't ever look at them anymore without thinking about that. And honestly, problem solving. I mean, how do you convey a beautiful idea? You do it in a creative way with whatever materials work. Serious design isn't always serious. So watches, especially in this day and age, watches are more jewelry than they are function because we all pull out our cell phone to see what time it is. But in the idea of watches being jewelry and people saying, I want a watch that matches my, my clothes, my whatever, they came up with the idea of these wonderful watches that had the bands that screwed around and you could change the colors of the bands. So serious design is we have an auditorium and we need chairs that we can move in and out and stack easily. Well, it doesn't mean they have to be ugly. So the idea of these handkerchief chairs was to create something that easily stacked, took up minimal space, did it in a secure fashion, but still had a sense of beauty and a sense of visual lightness. If you want a special evening sometime, next time you're in New York City, go to SD26 for dinner. Um, the Vignelli's developed the identity and designed the interior for this restaurant, and it's, it's yummy. It's pretty yummy. But there's a playfulness here, too, working with a fiber artist to create some of the designs that are on the walls, um, using materials that sometimes are really reflective, and other times very much a matte finish to sort of fold back into the background, this sort of glass screen. It's a space that's big and still feels really intimate. And it's the ceiling sparkles. And it's a wonderful place to be. It's playful and it's wonderful and it's yummy. The Vignellis have always said we want our design to be visually powerful, intellectually elegant, and timeless. So, some things are not timeless. Over time, as this book was developing, because of their failing health, there became an increasing urgency, get this done. And at the end, we really did just run out of time. In one of my final visits with Massimo, he apologized to me. And he said, I'm sorry I won't be able to see the finished book. And I hoped he was going to be wrong about that, but as usual, he was right. Um, but I guess for me, the good part of that was it did allow to add an afterword to the book, which was kind of like getting to put the period on the end of the sentence. Um, they say that you don't really know someone until you've spent time and you've been through a range of experiences with them. And so I have to say directly and indirectly, I've been really lucky to go through a lifetime of experiences with the Vignellis, and I really worked to convey that in my book. Leila and Massimo grew up in difficult times. They grew up in Italy in the midst of World War II. Massimo grew up as a child of divorce in a time and a place when that was not really accepted. He was far from wealth and he struggled in school. It would have been really easy to give up, to settle, to believe that possibilities were for other people. But he didn't do that. At first, Layla's family were worried about their young daughter dating this young man and they discouraged the relationship. Now it seems incredible that anyone would doubt Massimo or question his ability to be a success, and perhaps the challenge of overcoming all of those doubts helps to explain his success. Layla and Massimo began dating when she was still in high school. He was several years older, a college boy from the big city. And at that point in time, Layla could have been the dutiful daughter, and she could have listened to mom and dad, but she trusted what she felt in her heart, and she trusted Massimo. She said, I saw value in him, and I was going to help him. I wanted to show my family that they were wrong. And eventually, they did admit that. 
didn't take too long either. Over the years, they grew together, personally and professionally. I've seen the Vignellis happy, angry, excited. I've seen Layla worry about Massimo and Massimo worry about Layla. In the last months, I saw Massimo concerned, maybe even a little frightened at times, occasionally resigned. But what I also saw was a level of patience and a level of focus that revealed a strong character and a deep understanding of what's important. And I saw empathy and I saw continued appreciation for, for strong relationships on both a personal and a professional level. I saw a continued commitment to solving problems, even as Massimo became accepting of his inevitable end of mortality, of his inevitable mortality. He always said that he wanted to die at his desk with his pencil in his hand, and he essentially did just that. And that leads to the idea of inspiration. Layla liked to talk to students, and some of you perhaps were fortunate enough to be able to be part of that. And she liked to talk especially to the women because she knew, she was very conscious of being a role model for them. Be assertive, she would counsel. Don't be afraid to come out with a point of view. Don't be afraid to be heard. Look for examples, read biographies. It's very important to be able to compare your situation with others, especially when you are just getting started and you don't have the range of experience through some of the situations that you're encountering. Some of you are young, just getting started on your career paths. What do you want that path to be? If someone had told me when I was a student that someday I would be writing the Vignelli's biography, I would have seriously questioned their sanity. But that is what happened. And I'm standing here to tell you that you can do what I did and what the Vignelli's did, and that is to dream big, to seize every opportunity to connect with and hang out with the heroes who intrigue you and inspire you, who you talk to, what you think about, what you do is what you become. So why not reach for the very highest? Massimo talked about that, and he talked about making choices. When you're a student, you have choices, he said. Do you want to go skiing with your friends, or do you want to learn and be involved with design for changing society and improving quality of life? The only way to emerge through a crowd is through passion and enthusiasm. He said the good students tend to stick together and they become the leaders of the professions. It's a choice that you make. So think about connections forward, about where your choices can lead, because none of us lives on this earth forever. How much do you think about the legacy that you will leave? That's something that Massimo and Layla thought about, they cared about, and they planned for it. And you, all of you, sitting here in the Vignelli Center for Design Studies, reap the benefits of their thinking about their legacy. This center and the design education that it promotes, I think is the most important project out of a whole lifetime of work that the Vignellis developed. They knew that and they worked hard to make it a reality because they believed in the value of education to extend the value of design. So I ask you this, fast forward a few years, hopefully quite a few, and how can you build on this bold foundation that they've given you? What will your legacy be? Will you continue to validate the modernist generations before you by using your intelligence and your skills to make the world a better place? I hope so, and I encourage you to do so. Build from your Vignelli heritage, your modernist heritage, to enrich a culturally powerful and visually diverse world. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. It was great. Thanks. Just a few words.
Sure. Uh, it was um, unfortunate that uh, the timing, because Massimo passed away in uh, late May, as I recall. May 27th. May 27th, when uh, basically RIT was out of session. So we, it was really impossible for us to have any kind of memorial service here. So Jan, I think today is really our memorial service for, for Massimo and for celebrating the, uh, not only Massimo, but Loa as well. And thank you for that and for all the feeling in your, in your presentation. Uh, two things, uh, one is uh, the, uh, our, our good friends and colleagues at the uh, RIT Press have uh, brought over copies of, um, of Vignelli books, including Jan's book in the back. And so after we're finished here, she will be back there and be glad to uh, sign any books for you. Secondly, uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Katie Nix and um, Jennifer Whitlock informed me that um, there are um, on display up on the fourth floor of the uh, Vignelli Center, a whole array of, of, of original Vignelli artifacts. Uh, so if any of you'd like to stop up there on your way after the, uh, we're finished here, please be, uh, feel welcome to do that. You can access the, through the stairway right in the back and up to, up to the top floor. And, uh, and so uh, again, thank you, Jan, for, for your presentation and thank all of you for coming today. Thanks, guys. If, if you haven't been up there and if you haven't seen Massimo's drawings, I mean, the guy was a genius with a pencil and it's just really fun to see that immediacy of it. So definitely go upstairs and take a look. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. I, I have a comment and a question. Uh, sure. First of all, I just, I really appreciated this presentation because I think, uh, as, as uh, Roger said, uh, you, this is in a way a kind of a memorial service for- You gotta stop uh, this or you're gonna get me. And, <laughs> and, uh, but I think it, it, what you have to say here today helps to reinforce the importance of our carrying the torch. Mm -hmm. and, and moving on with this legacy and keeping it alive for young designers who are coming up through the ranks. And Absolutely. We want them to have whatever experience they can now have, even though he's not here. We have this resource, and it's great. And my question was, um, do you think in your last moments with Massimo that he had a sense of optimism about the future of design? Or did you have a sense of how he viewed the future in any way? I think he saw great potential for great things to happen because great things have happened. And so there's no reason for them not to continue to happen with a caveat. Mm -hmm. Massimo, for those of you who knew him well, had a constant railing against the frivolity of people who were using the tools and the materials of design without thoughtfulness um, and very much felt that design education was an incredibly important thing because only with education would students have the ability to know that your legacy sitting in this room goes back a century and beyond. And only by knowing that legacy and knowing and being taught how to use materials and how to work thoughtfully could good things readily be expected to happen. And so I think he was optimistic. I mean, look at it this way. If he wasn't an optimist about there being the potential for great things in the future, why would he have put heart and soul into making this place happen. Because this didn't happen overnight. This was something he had thought about for many, many years. What year was the groundbreaking? Do you remember? We moved in in 2010, and the groundbreaking was uh, about two or three years before that. So two or three years before that, and the, and the talking about wouldn't it be nice started years and years before that. So I think, yes, there's an optimism, because this is an absolute physical manifestation of it. Other questions? How long did you work on this project? 
um, two years and 20 plus. Um, little bit of background. In 2010, I published the book Unimark International with Lars Mueller Publishers in, in Switzerland. And Massimo was one of the founders and leaders of that group in the mid 60s, late 70s, or mid 60s through 70s. And so as a grad student, and, and I think teachers will get a kick out of this, I was rather unique because everyone else is thinking about their thesis project and they're saying, I want to create something really interesting and oh, I have to write a paper to go with it too. And I, I said, I'd really like to do some sort of a written research project about design history. And stumbled on to the idea of Unimark. And so in 1987, I went to, I had been to Europe but I'd never been to New York City. And in 87, I got a hold of Massimo and I said, I'm a grad student at Iowa State and I'm coming to New York and I'm interested in Unimark and could I possibly talk to you? And he wrote back, of course, pre-email pre days. Um, Absolutely, there's nothing I'd like to talk about more. So the first time I met him was in their 10th Avenue offices in New York City. And it really felt like a Dorothy, you are not in Kansas anymore kind of a moment when I walked in there. It was definitely not a place that was anything like anything I had ever experienced. But from that moment on, we kept in touch over the years. I did my thesis on Unimark. I always thought it would turn into a book someday. Well, those someday things sometimes drag out for a while because I graduated with my graduate degree in 88, and I finally published the book in 2010, so never say never. But as that book came out, um, Massimo began talking to me more and, and asked if I would be interested in working on a biography for he and Layla. And so I would say really from about 2010, 2011-ish is when I really started digging into this book. But of course, some of the notes go back 20 years, which makes it fun. So it's, it's fun. Long-time projects aren't a bad thing. Any other questions? All right, thanks much. I'll sign books if you want. <laughs> thanks, Roger. Thank you, Jan.